shall we name this one? Welcome to the world, little Caleb. There is danger forming around us. Shoes are no longer able to own pets. The important thing is that I can hear their prayer. What would I do without you, Caleb? <laughs> Just us now. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm good. So nice to meet you. I am, a, after decades and decades of loving your work, I am thrilled to get to, to meet and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Especially about this film. I've been enjoying your stuff going back to the days of the Helen Reddy show. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I can't believe that. that was like one of my very, very first jobs. I never missed that show. Ever. Oh. Ever. Die hard oh. Helen Reddy fan. Yes. She was I was so upset when she passed away. I'm so shocked. Broke so my shocked. heart. Broke my Debbie, heart. Debbie, I have to tell you one thing which is so funny. When I was little, all I wanted was to be Debbie Lynn and not just Lynn. <laughs> and I would I asked my parents to please rename me Debbie Lynn and I would sign everything Debbie Lynn with a heart over the eye. So when when Sapere sent me your information, I laughed because <laughs> there it was, Debbie Lynn. <laughs> Well, you can you can have it vicariously. Thank you. <laughs> but I I have to admit to you that one of my all time favorite guilty pleasures is just my imagination that oh, that starred Gene and Tom Wopat. But as you know, Gene Smart is just brilliant. Everything she does is great. Yeah. So I, I loved working with her. Yeah. Loved it. Uh, but it is just so so exciting to get to talk to you because I. You have filled me with so much joy on the screen. Well, I, I think you, you've not only made my day, you may have made my whole month. So thank oh. you so much. But what you have done with Shepard tops everything. This movie, as I originally wrote to Sapir, this, will war this is warm enough to melt the coldest Nazi heart. I hope so. This film is... You left no stone unturned here, Lynn. Your approach, the way you and your cinematographer, uh, Gabor, the way that you maintain dog and kid eye level in this film. So you immerse us from that POV. We retain that. So it gives us, you know, we are on equal footing or equal pause with Caleb and Joshua. And it, there's very little dutching, but when there's dutching, it's going <laughs> upwards, uh, especially in a couple scenes with Ken Dukin as Ralph. You know, it, the camera will dutch up, but by the same yes. token, yes. more often than not, what you do is you have the adults, you know, when you go into a close-up or a tight two-shot, you have the adults down on the level with Caleb or with Joshua, so that we have the fat man who gets him after the family has to give him up. Well, we see him, he's sitting in the chair with the dog with him, or he's sitting on the ground holding him because of his mean, nasty wife. Um, everything is brought down to that level, and you have the humans come down on that level. Even Ralph, he'll be sitting on a table instead of standing. When he's standing, either you pull out or you go in close on the reaction of Caleb, then Blitzy. It's so... Your visuals are so... They are storytelling in this film. I, I mean, I, the truth is that, I, you know, I'm getting teary-eyed listening to you say this because for you to have seen our intention and, and the fact that, you know, that, that we succeeded because you could just say what you said now is thrilling. It's just thrilling. You know, and, and you use color so beautifully. You've got the sun-drenched tall windows in the family home at the opening, the colorful villages, the intimacy and, and color and warmth of the, the family Seder. And, you know, then color starts once, once 
Caleb is taken away and the family disappears, color starts stripping. Exactly. And we go to, to browns and grays and it's disgusting. And you really focus on the dirt and grime in that work camp with the pigs in the slop and rolling in it and mud. It's like it rained forever. Um, Can we take you everywhere with us? <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> but then slowly as Joshua escapes... You bring color back. We have the resistance Hi. fighters. You've got color in the clothing, campfires, candlelight, which bookends us back with the family and the Seder candlelight and the color and the lighting. And then you give us that final scene with the moonlight glistening on the water after Caleb has just rescued Joshua or Joshua has rescued Caleb. Uh, you can look at it either way. But it's like a baptism, a life reaffirmed and renewed. You touched everything with this film. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for seeing all of this. It's just... Hey, oh, it makes it all worthwhile. This, it really does. This is masterful filmmaking, Lynn. Oh, well, this thank you. And the cinematographer is really oh. talented. He is so talented. Boy, did you luck out. I know. And the truth is, the, the, the cinematographer who was supposed to do it was getting his teeth, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, implants. He was oh, getting God. Implants. <laughs> and he couldn't do it. I was freaking out. And this one came along. And, you know, everything happens for a reason, as they say. This was the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh. I hope the other guy's implants are great. But this is, you know... <laughs> You know, I'm, it was a blessing. I, you know, I'm I'm really curious. How did Kravitz's book find its way to you? And then, how challenging was it for you to adapt that book into this film, thinking cinematically as how uh, as to how you can translate the emotion and tone of the book onto the screen? Well, I found out about the book because I was teaching a master class in Tel Aviv during mm -hmm. the summers on filmmaking. And I was teaching the kids how to pitch, how to pitch ideas. And so one of the students came and said, well, my friend is about to write a book, and now I'm going to pitch it to you. And he told the story, and I, this was like seven or eight years ago or something, a long time ago. And I, when I heard the idea, I said, I, I, I just have to, I have to, I have to do this. I have to do this. It just, I became obsessed, so I waited for the book to be written, and I optioned the idea, I optioned the book, I optioned the book again and again and again, and then finally we were able to make it into a movie. Wow. How challenging yeah. was writing the script for this one? What? I'm sorry, what? How challenging was the actual adaptation and writing the script? Well, you know, I, I, as you know, I, I, I've... I've adapted several um, novels, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's always a challenge, but um, this one I had to change because I did not want to have voiceover for the dog. I didn't want to have a talking dog or voiceover, because if you think about like the last dozen dog movies, they've all had this voiceover. Yeah. So I felt that it was a much more intense experience to, for us to understand what the dog was feeling, doing, seeing without him telling us. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think you made the, uh, an extremely wise decision because the minute you add a voiceover of an animal, it kind of, I don't, it, it, I don't like to use the word, but it cheapens it. It lowers the IQ of the film and makes it more cutesy. This is not a cutesy subject. No. No, it's not. And the book had a completely different tone in that it was much more mm, sarcastic and mm. more geared towards adults and um, kind of a, uh, you know, a um, sardonic point of view. Mm -hmm. it, it had those elements, which I enjoyed reading tremendously, but knew that that's not the tone I wanted for the film. I wanted to be more family um, accessible and kind of much more kind of raw emotion, pure and raw emotion. Well, and you definitely achieved that. And, you know, with the approach that you took, without a canine voiceover or a pig voiceover or any other animal voiceovers, Not, um, yeah. you know, that then begs the question of casting 
the dog. Because obviously you had more than one dog, but because you wanted to rely on the look on the dog's face, the dog's reaction to people, to other dogs, you've got to get the right dogs in there to convey that emotion. Absolutely. Well, so it all started, you know, remotely because I was here in Los Angeles and, um, and the, the dog trainer was in Budapest in Hungary. So they would send me, all, you know, we would have all kinds of we transfer and Dropbox going every day back and forth, watching the dogs being trained, and everything looked great. But when I got to Hungary and I saw the main dog that they wanted to use, that dog would not make eye contact with me. So as beautiful as the dog was, I used that dog for other things, for the swimming, for the biting and the snarling and everything. Mm -hmm. But the main dog with those soulful eyes was able to make eye contact. And, and I thought that was very important. Oh. It was a very focused dog. And that face and those eyes are just, the camera eats them up and then your heart just wells. I mean, it's you see that, and then you put August right there with him, and it's like, oh, my God. Buggy will tell you the story of his, you know, his life with dogs and how he approached all of this and how he learned to be with a dog. He'll tell you that when you talk to him. Oh, my God. You know, but you didn't just have the Caleb Blitzy dogs to work with. You had all the street dogs in there, too. And, of course, as we all know, W.C. Field said it best, no kids, no dogs. Um, <laughs> you blew that. You know, you got them both here. Um, so true. How challenging was it directing not just one dog, but multiple dogs? Because well, they, there's some very intense scenes there with the dogs bonding and with one feeling left out and then the compassion that one dog has for another. Right. That is a message right. to people that, you know, people, you need to have this same kind of compassion for each other. It's great metaphor. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, um, yes, of course, I had heard that, that warning all, all my <laughs> life. But to tell you the truth, um, well, let me preface this by saying I have worked with some divas in my life that children and dogs combined don't even come close <laughs> to this. To this of working with, you know, people demanding this and that. I, I actually love working with children, and now I love working with dogs. We had 40 animals in this on this film, they told me. Wow. All together. But again, we had fabulous dog trainers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we would go over the scene and over the scene again and again, and they would, until they really understood it, and then they could train the dogs to create that mm-hmm wow i mean those dogs the, the compassion that you that comes through the screen from those dogs and similarly the joy and something that you do that i really loved hearing was wad's score um oh, this the, the composition so you brought that up. the composition itself is beautiful and he has some wonderful motifs in there but then you get into the actual musical arrangement and the choice of instrumentation so that we get the ethnic and religious notes in there. But then we see scenes, you give us a rest from the horrors of Caleb being on his own. We don't know what's happened to Joshua yet. And we see the dogs frolicking in the street. And that score in that moment, it takes on a lighter note that just buoys us up a bit that there's hope. And that such a small element in the in the grand scheme of the score, but it comes at a perfect time in the film that carries us into what is about to ha unfold for us. Oh, good, good. Uh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. He, he is, uh, you know, he's um, Russian and Polish trained, and he's a real, he's a real musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's classically trained and he's and he heard the theme in his head came running over played it out on, on my out of tune piano and it was right he just he had watched the film he heard that melody and it, 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 that's what we used wow wow the score is just so beautiful and i i love it when we've got when 
we use composers that they are classically trained. They do have that depth within them and they really bring it um, to the fore and they know how to use the elements of music for a film. And he, I just, I love this score. It's beautiful. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear this. Yeah, I, I actually, I love it too. And, and then some of it was, you know, done by the uh, Budapest Film Score um, Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he had live musicians. He wasn't there, but he did it remotely. Right. But yeah, because it this... also makes a big difference. This, you know, there's something about electronic music that just doesn't cut it. Mm -mm. I want full orchestra. I want full orchestra always. Yeah. You know, yeah. it just, um, it makes all the difference, especially in a film like this. You know, I'm, I'm really curious, Lynn, because one of the very important things about this film is that because the youth of today, many of which are very poorly educated, um, they don't even know about the Holocaust. I'm... They know nothing about this. How important was it for you in making this film? Did, number one, did that even enter your mind that this is going to be a teaching tool or a learning tool for families and for kids? It for, was forefront in my mind. I can't tell you. It was one of the motivations, one of the purposes of making the film. Because, you know, these... Statistics came out recently that the millennials had no idea what the Holocaust was or even had never heard of Auschwitz. And, but it's, it's just the, the general lack of, of, of knowledge of history of not only the Holocaust but other events Everything. in this world and in this, on this planet that people should know about. Um, so, yes, this, this was a, a, a prime reason to make the film and also to make it palatable to younger people. Mm -hmm. So I did, you know, there were many, many scenes where I, I, I just said, you know, is this going to be too much for an 11 or a 12 year old? Because I pretty much knew that, it, you know, the, the future of the film would, would have some educational purposes. So, um, you know, the scene where Ralph is going to shoot him, I, I, I shot that both ways with the gun and without the gun. Mm -hmm because I thought it would be too much, but it did not have in the impact without the gun. So, mm. yeah, so I had to leave it in, but just, you know, in, I made it a work camp instead of a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to make it t too bland or too, uh, I, I didn't want to minimize things too much, but I, right. I did want to make it palatable if it was people's first, children, young people's first introduction yeah. to this. Because I know some of my generation, um, it, it, what we learned was so traumatic that we yeah. had nightmares for years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Too much, too soon, too, you know, the images were too horrible. I mean, obviously it was horrible, but I think we had to be older until we were able to absorb them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you made the right choice, because I noticed that, that this was a work camp, not a concentration camp. Um, so, and I like how some of it was toned out because I'm from your generation. I'm of your generation. And oh. yes, it was very, cause I'm 63. So it was very uh -huh. much, very much, very graphic, very, it's like, yeah, they're giving us the information and they're not holding back. Yeah. So yeah. once, so I noticed that you did, re, you know, restrain yourself a little bit from going full bore and I think that was a really smart thing to do. Good. Thank you, Debbie. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we had also, I was just thinking while you were talking, we had the Diary of Anne Frank. But I think that girls related to that more than boys. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, and I'm hoping that boys will, will relate to this because it's a, a boy character and it's a little bit more action-packed. Well, yeah. it, it's a boy and his dog. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> nobody ever talks about a girl and her dog. They always talk that's about a so boy. True. They talk that's about a, funny. a boy. A girl and her dog. Wait a minute. That, that has to be my next movie. I think, I think so. I think it should be. But, yeah, when you think about it, nobody ever talks about a girl and her dog. It's always a boy oh, and his dog. Oh, that's so interesting. 
Nobody has mentioned that. Never hear that phrase, a girl and her dog. It's so interesting. Your hope of bringing boys into the, into the conversation here with this film, I think you're spot on. And, you know, I, I do want to say, it's, I, 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 my dream would be for, for people of all ethnic backgrounds oh. and, and colors and religions and uh, to see it and relate it to their own history also. Yes. You know, a, a little boy in, in Japan who says to his mother, why did they take the dog away? Why did they do that? And she explains what happened. And then she says, you know what happened to us? Do you have any idea about our history? Yeah. And the same thing with our, you know, Armenians and Syrians, and you know, it. it this is this is unfortunately uh, analogous to other plights of other people. Yeah, and plights that are still happening today, as we speak. Yeah, I, it's yeah. so. This is a very timely film, as well, for today's audience, for today's world. You know, I'm I'm curious, Lynn, because this was obviously not an easy shoot. You're shooting in the winter or late fall in Hungary. You've got dogs. You've got a kid. You've got people that, that don't speak English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what did you learn about yourself as a filmmaker tackling all these aspects and telling a story on top of it all? Well, what did you learn about yourself as a filmmaker that you can now take forward into your future projects, be it as a producer, be it as a director, be it as a writer, or wearing the triumvirate of three? Um, I guess I learned that I was a lot stronger than I thought I was, that I had stamina that I didn't even know <laughs> existed within me, and that um, with all of these pressures and yeah being so far away from home and having to have interpreters for some things i just felt that if if i just kept my mind on what i wanted to get the results that i wanted to get and not go on a roller coaster ride of all the other things that come into play on a production with mm -hmm. egos and people and problems and this and that um i would get the best results just to, you know, stay laser-focused, laser-focused. Well, the proof is in the pudding, Lynn. Well. Um, it, this is, it is, it, this is masterful storytelling. It truly well, is. I, I can't tell you, first of all, thank you so much, Debbie Lynn, who has the name that I always wanted my <laughs> whole life. But uh, I, the, some of the things that you have said have just... Oh, I just can't tell you how appreciative I am, and it, it, it's such it, it's such a triumph that you saw these things. You're you're obviously a filmmaker, right? I, I, I don't uh, you obviously have experience in all of this. Oh yeah, I I worked in production for a number of years. I am trained in television and film, and I still produce small you know shorts and things now. Uh huh. Yeah, I can I can tell by your the, the questions and your sensibility. So. All you know, all good things to you in those endeavors as well. Oh, but, thank um, you. I'm just so appreciative that Sapir and Melody and Dylan know you and found you, and <laughs> and that you are, you know, that you're going to give this film some attention. I'm really appreciative. Oh, I'm chomping at the bit with Memorial Day coming, and of course Memorial Day is a perfect time for this film to come out as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Memorial it is. Day weekend. It absolutely is. It just, you know, the whole question. Is are, are people going to go to the theaters? Are they going to go? I was at the Lemley Royale. Are you in Los Angeles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I went to the Ridley. I just went, you know, to snoop around, and whew, people still aren't going to the movies yet. Well, I think in L.A., once we finally get that um, that masks off, that June fifteenth, California uh -huh. gets to come back. Yeah. I think that may make a big difference. I hope so, because we need, people need to get back in the theaters, they need that shared communal experience, and, you know, just to live and exist again, you know, it, it, we've been, we're walking out of our own kind of work camp. Yeah, isn't it the truth? For the past yeah. 14, 15 months, and, know. you know, like young, you know, young Joshua and Caleb are going to have to learn how to navigate in the world again. In a new yep. place, so do we. But, you know, the, the two aspects.
aspects of the film got me through the p- pandemic because when I, you know, when I was working on the film this past year, I would say, look what these people went through. Yes. You know? I mean, what we have, we have water, we have electricity, you know, we have food being delivered. I mean, we have toilet just- paper. We have toilet paper, exactly. You know, let's let's get real here. And then the other thing was, I don't know what I would have done without my dog during this pandemic. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't know what I would have done. Yep. It made such a difference. So the film really was, you know, really helped through the, the experience. Oh, well, I, I can't wait to see what you do next, Lynn. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. My my whole purpose for the next couple of months now is just to get people in the theaters. And you know, when I stepped into a theater last night at Lemley, mm-hmm. oh my God, it was so great. <laughs> <laughs> the smell and the big screen and the dark room. Oh my God, it was so exciting. Yep. Well, like Frances McDormand said when she got her award, you know, go back into the theaters. That's what, you know, that's where we belong for movies. That is, t- amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, Lynn, this has been such a pure joy speaking me to too. you. Thank you. I hope we have the opportunity one day to actually meet in person. So. Well, I sure hope so, because it, yes. will, it will be yes. a joy, an absolute okay. delight. Well, oh. Thank you for everything. You're going to talk to Augie now, and he's a wonderful boy, man, becoming a man. <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy enjoy that, okay? So I I'm will. signing off now. Thank you again. Thank you thank again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.